Hi guys, welcome to Dead by Tomorrow Interviews. My name is Daniel Winter and my co-host is Andrew Monroe. As we explore different topics that are worth thinking about today, we want to bring in guests to share their own unique perspective. We hope you enjoy hearing from our guests as much as we enjoy talking to them. Well, hello, everyone. We've got a little special episode for you guys today. Daniel is not with us at the moment, but I do have Scott Hawkins. And if you haven't heard of him, he is the author of The Library at Mount Char and from all accounts, a programmer, which we'll get into more. So, Scott, welcome to the show. I'm very excited to have you. I'm glad you survived your appendicitis last week. Uh, That was a little scary. How about you tell yeah. us a little bit about yourself, <laughs> besides, you know, your missing organ. <laughs> well, at the time I wrote Mount Char, I was, in fact, working as a programmer. These days, uh, it's more of a systems administration kind of thing. Um, I work for a large healthcare company that I probably should mention doing, like, the, kind of the care and feeding of big data, moving insurance claims from one end of the, you know, one end of the pipeline, like doctor's offices, to, to the other. So it's more systems-level stuff with, you know, occasional development kind of thing. And uh, I live in uh, a suburb of Atlanta called Canton uh, with my wife, and we're we're down to one dog. We had six this time last year, and it's been a rough year for dogs. We we got them all. Uh, we we got them all at the same time, and they've been they only live so long, and so we've we've had quite a few casualties over over twenty twenty two. That anyway. may be the saddest thing I've heard on our podcast yet. Oh, um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. I, don't sorry. I don't no, it's okay. I laugh because I'm really depressed now. That's really that, that's tough. That's a lot of loss in one year. Yeah, it was it was pretty brutal. Um, they had they they had good lives. So I mean, you know, I, I, I don't know if you keep dogs, but they, you know, it, everybody is mortal, and we did the best we could for them. And it's you know, kind of celebrate the good times. Try not to absolutely. Yeah. No, I've I've got one, and it's it's one of those things that you kind of put in the back of your head, like, well, he's just gonna oh. live forever, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and you just don't want to think about that because it's sad. You Deny know, it I'm, until the day. <laughs> That's my exactly. approach. Exactly. I I have probably more ability to emotionally accept people dying than I do uh, pets dying, which is probably something yeah. wrong with me, but it's a lot tougher I don't know. That's, than that's, it is for people. That's pretty common. There was a, I, there was uh, some Brazilian horror movie not too long ago that I just couldn't watch it. It was about um, people abandoning dogs, and they like all the dogs banded together and took over Sao Paulo or whatever it was. I just couldn't watch it. I couldn't watch the – it was like just, you know, I can sit through – you know, martyrs or even you know, the, the darkest stuff you can imagine. Um, mm-hmm. And it doesn't bother me, but with bringing a dog into it, I just can't watch. No, I, I totally get it. I, it's why I like John Wick so much. I, I assume you've seen that. But yes, I, absolutely. Like, yeah. Best revenge. I was like, yes, they killed a dog. Bring <laughs> hellfire down on them. Yeah. This, is, <laughs> this is the most realistic movie I've ever seen. <laughs> yeah. Kill your mom. Yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> hey, man, that wasn't cool. But you know what? We can get over this, but not the dog. <laughs> so. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that was a good. Yeah, that's a good flick. They're really holding up pretty well. It's like a, the series is not, you know, normally the second and third movies in a series are, are pretty bad. But I actually thought the third one was pretty good. I loved it. I, I'm very yep. excited for the fourth to come out. Um, yep. So far, each one of them has just been on point for me, which I don't know how you do. Like, it seems like such a throwaway concept. And then they just keep like, oh, here's a good rationale on why this movie exists. You're like, oh, OK, yeah, I like yeah, it. Yeah, they're, they're doing good. They're doing good work. They're, you know, I've, I've got a little. uh love for japan kind of thing going on in that oh yeah one. and this is actually going to segue into something about your book so be prepared but <laughs> i loved that they brought in this the the whole little ninja thing going on i the end without giving away too many spoilers though at this point if you haven't seen the third john wick like you're two three years behind so like get on that train but you know where the guy is dying and he's talking to john wick and he's like man that this was great i love this you know he's being really like <laughs> whatever that is that almost like respectful friendly like hey did you have yeah. as much fun as i did in this <laughs> combat i just that yeah. spoke to me on such a level i loved it <laughs> yeah that's that that was really fun it's good you know, the whole yeah i mean the whole thing is just you know it's a little bit over the top but still cool Mm-hmm. Well, maybe more than a little, but um, <laughs> yeah, super. yeah, yeah, I used a okay. horse as a yeah, gun sorry. or something. I yeah, loved that. Right. I loved it. Yeah, the, that, that was what I was like. Oh, okay, these guys are—they're really going for it. They're just having fun. I, I don't know if you knew this, uh, and I promise we'll, we'll get to the book. Uh, the guy who made the movies, who directed them, was actually his stunt double from The Matrix, I think. And because, oh no, I didn't know that. Yeah, he he took care of him so well. Uh, Keanu Reeves took care of his stunt double so well the guy ended up becoming a director and then maybe not exactly as a thank you but as a like hey i really liked working with you and you know you kind of made me who i am 
let's make a movie specifically for you as Keanu Reeves. And that's where John Wick came from was basically his stunt double became a director. And was like, this is the movie made for Keanu Reeves to play to his strengths. So that's really cool. I didn't, I didn't know that. I knew, I knew the story about Keanu, like, uh, take, you know, financially he gave a lot of his salary to like the FX guys on the, on the matrix. Mm -hmm. Um, and that, um, so yeah, yeah that's actually, that He's sounds like cool Keanu. Guy. Yeah. I wish yeah. I could be like him. I'm, I'm not as, kind-hearted or as a uh, wholesome as Keanu Reeves is. Keanu Reeves <laughs> is like, someone kill my yeah. dog. <laughs> Keanu Reeves and Mr. Rogers, man. Those are the two. Oh, <laughs> that's, yeah. we, that's what America needs. Yeah. Jeez. If only more people were like them. Yeah. Okay. So I, obviously I'm a fan of your book, right? Uh, that's why I reached <laughs> Thank out. Thank you. Thank you. You did a great job. Um, we won't, you know, make you suffer through too many compliments here. Cause I know that can be awkward, but I was rereading the book in preparation for you coming on. Cause I was like, you know, it's been a little bit, it, it's been five years, I think since I read it. Uh, and that's, that's really actually how we got here was I was like, man, I wonder if Scott's come out with another book. I'll go look uh, around and, uh, you know, I was like, well, I'll reach out to him, you know, love to chat with him. So I was re-listening to it and there's two things that came up. One, you seem to have a pretty maybe not heavy Asian influence, but you, you seem to have a lot of Japanese things that kind of bled in from another guy who likes Japanese stuff. Was I reading too much into that or is that something that falls into your wheelhouse? No, it is. Um, I, I actually took Japanese in college. It's the only language I ever studied in any depth. Uh, and that's where a lot of that came from. So you get, you know, it was interested in the culture and um, <laughs> that, that kind of thing. And I didn't, I, at the time, I, I was never, honestly, I really wasn't very good at it. I, I studied for about three years and, you know, I was trying to watch <laughs> Japanese movies and it's just, it's a tough language. Uh, but I, yes, you're, you're absolutely right about that. I am, I, I am, and I was and am interested. That is funny because that is exactly if, if you, I was to describe my dabbling in Japanese, that was, that's what mine was. Three years in college, got really into it, really started with wanting to, you know, kind of watch stuff in Japanese, got heavily into it for throughout three years, getting a minor and then. Uh, you know, things kind of fall away, but like, I still have kind of that cultural and language kind of view or perspective or lens added on to my traditional American yes. you know, viewpoint. Yeah. So that's, that's what really stood. I was like, oh, he looks like he did more than just Google a couple of Japanese words here, but you know, I'm no expert. Yeah. 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 There was, um, yeah, I mean, the, the, it was actually, it was a really cool class the guy. Uh, the, the, the school I went to had, uh, like a, an international business department where like it was just totally immersive. Um, mm -hmm. and they would, you know, and so like all the students for, for Japanese lived on the Japanese floor in some particular dorm and the, the professor that I took studied under most, um, ran all that. So he would give it, I wasn't in that department. I wasn't in that program, but, um, a lot of the kind of, they would have activities for, you know, Japanese, uh, you know, culture and that we were invited to them if we wanted to come. And I did sometimes. So it was, it was a good experience. That's awesome. Do you have a favorite yeah, word in Japanese that you still like hang on to? Um, yeah. Uh, Ishi no Eni san in this, uh, three years on a stone. So the idea was that if you sit on a stone for three years, your body heat will warm it up. And, you know, the idea being that patience uh, is the way to accomplish your goals. That is a great idiom. I don't think I've, I've heard that. I love really that one. Oh, that's good. I'll have to add that into the show notes so we can keep it going. <laughs> that's great i my personal is gomburu i just thought that was just the coolest little word that doesn't exactly translate into english but now i've got to come up with something a lot fancier you know for next time <laughs> okay well it's been a uh, like so that's that's the one that stuck with me after uh, kind of 30 years now i think um <laughs> that's, that's a long time to try and remember yeah. stuff because I, I assume you're in the same boat as me and it's just where's the time to practice that language that nobody in yeah. speaks you know outside of japan <laughs> yeah yeah, that's, it's, it's tough to, I, uh, a buddy of mine, um, was going to Japan a couple of years ago. We practiced a little bit, but it was, you know, neither one of us were native speakers. So. <laughs> well, we can find the bathroom. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Well, there you go. So something else that, uh, came up while I was doing my reread on this that I was curious about again, because of hypothetically shared experiences, you seem to have a, a bit of a. I'm trying to think of the right word here. More knowledge than Google might give you about breaking and entering into places. So hypothetically, was that something that one of your friends maybe did? Because uh, <laughs> no, hypothetically, I, I might have had something similar. Nothing like nothing like that. I had uh, I read a lot of true crime books. Uh, like not, not I don't my wife my wife likes the, like the the you know somebody got murdered kind of true crime books. Uh -huh. You know, uh, I'm more on the like bank robbers and uh, uh, you know burglars and 
that that into the scale. I just think I don't know. I don't know why. I just think that stuff's interesting. Um, so I've read I've read a lot of memoirs by people who were you know ultimately unsuccessful. Otherwise, they wouldn't have written a memoir. But I, I don't know. That's that sort of stuff just always really interested me. I got you. Wink. Uh, understood. Yeah. Wink. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Yeah. Not. And you know, I, there was a certain amount of juvenile delinquency in my background. So well, I, I, I never to the point of breaking and entering. See, uh, we we never tried to. And I'll, I'll say we in a royal sense, um, you know, everybody's got to have their little phase that they go through, I guess you could say. And some people, it's, you know, alcoholism or whatever. But yeah. I uh, I got really into getting into buildings that I wasn't supposed to necessarily yeah. in college. We didn't like the ex- you know, take exploring anything. Thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was just urban exploring, I think, was the term at the time. And it's kind of popular yeah. online. But, you know, just finding ways to get into places that you weren't supposed to. And, you know, we had lock picks and bolt cutters, and, you know, yeah. all the stuff. And, uh, yeah. you know. We'll leave it yep. at that, but it was a great time. Uh, very dangerous, but I had a blast. And so I was reading through the book. I was like, oh, you know, yeah, it seems like stuff that. that I would, you know, yeah, to have a little insider knowledge on. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I played around with it, but nothing, you know. Exactly. Uh, it's just play, and, and you know. <laughs> the, the statute of limitations is up, and I, I never hurt anybody, so. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, that's that's the goal. So those were there was just a couple of things I thought was pretty interesting that popped out yeah. on the second read through. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> yeah. See, oh yeah the internet's forever this is going to show up next time i do a job interview <laughs> no no it's been a long time it, you know 30 years plus you're safe you're safe <laughs> so how did you you became a coder um i assume you studied that in school I did. Uh, and then you're now a sysadmin um which is you know basically from what i understand most technical guys dream job because uh you get to tell other people what you want done from what i understand I'm not super technical. I've got enough to get dangerous sometimes, but how how did that fit with writing a book, becoming a, writing multiple books? I know you've got some technical uh, manuals as well, but fantasy I mean, author, coder, you know, sysadmin, pretty technical guy. What do you see yourself more of and how did the two kind of branch out? Like those don't usually go together, I guess is what I'm getting at. I gotcha. I, um, I mean, it, it seems like they wouldn't, but here's the thing. Um, I've talked to, I talked to, I always wanted to write, getting a novel, being a novelist was always my goal. Um, and I was thinking about this in, in, you know, in college when I was picking a major and stuff. And I, I kind of naturally gravitated toward the English department. Um, but I would also journalism or something like that. Um, but I, I was reading a lot of people who were, you know, working journalists, but also, you know, novelists. And they would say like the last thing they wanted to do after they got done with a, you know, a full day job of, of, work, uh, you know, do, you know, writing sports columns or whatever was to come home and work on their novel. They just didn't have, they were drained, you know? Sure. So I, I, I that's kind of why I shied away from that. And, uh, I, um, I, I think that really holds up well. And it, it, as it turns out, uh, working in a technical field, um, uh, really is, is a nice complementary skill set to, uh, to, you know, kind of, it uses, I guess the analytical part of your brain and you don't have to spend a whole lot of time talking. You're more staring at the screen and typing. Um, but then at the end of the day, you can go be verbal, um, and it's, it exercises. It, it doesn't feel like work when I, it feels like a vacation when I'm going to do the, the, the writing part, um, as opposed to just, you know, an extension of my day job. Um, so I, in that play, in that, I actually think that would work out really well. And uh, I so just got kind of, kinda... like, get to work two sides of the coin kind of there, you know, Hey, here's, here's this analytical, we'll call it right brain side. And that kind of eats up that energy space. And you get to go to the left brain side afterwards and kind of reinvigorate yourself working on something completely different. Exactly. Exactly. I, I like that. That makes sense. Yeah. And, and the, oh, go ahead. the flip, the flip side of it is this is actually really interesting. I, since, since I got published, I don't know why this is true, but I, I, I almost have no interest in reading fiction. Um, very little, maybe one, maybe one out of 10 books I read these days is fiction. I'm all, I'm, I'm all about the history and the memoirs and, and that kind of thing. And I used to read, that was all, novels used to be all I read, but it kind of feels like work now. I mean, I'm like reading through this other, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, you're kind of your, uh, your own critical editor kicks in when you're reading somebody else's work and it becomes work. If that makes sense. <laughs> you're, you start dissecting, like how, how did they, you know, tie these yeah, two exactly. things together you know you're looking for the tools you're looking for that the back end now instead of enjoying the fiction exactly i, I get exactly. that i've run into the same yeah. problem yeah <laughs> you gotta, you gotta I, turn your brain off completely unanticipated and not, honestly not really all that not something i would have asked I, i'm not really i'm not super happy about it but it just seems to be the way it worked out so if i'm you know if i'm writing i just 
I got I got to read something other than fiction to unwind. Yeah. I get it. No, that's. I do think that's a trade off because you you went through that whole process, and you, you know, in your case, I imagine it took a lot because you have a very clever book, and I assume you know that is not something that just happens and so now yeah. you're looking at what other authors are doing like oh that was clever how'd they do that oh i see and you you're recognizing yeah. the bones of somebody else doing the same work you did and yeah that's that's tough bad yes, trade-off don't become a writer guys uh, if you like reading <laughs> yeah <laughs> it's honestly yeah I, I think that's fair so you released that that was 2015 correct sounds right yeah so <laughs> something like this it wasn't last year um, no yeah now to me, you had an incredibly successful book, like Library at Mount Char, you know, that's how I found it, you know, bestseller list, lots of people talking about it, good reads the whole nine yards. Does that mean, you know, does that, do you consider yourself a successful, you know, novelist now? Or was that just one of those things that you kind of pushed away and you still see yourself more as a successful career tech guy that just happened to have a book that, you know, made some money? Ooh, tough I question. assume made some money. I guess I'm making assumptions there, but yeah, it did okay. It, I mean, financially did okay. You can't retire off of it, but it didn't hurt anything. Sure. Um, yeah. Uh, so, I mean, God, I don't, I, like I said, I always thought of myself as a writer first and that was true even before the book, the book got published. Um, but, uh, I, as you put, you know, kind of, it, it's true that it's been since 2015 and I have written other stuff since then. It's just nobody's liked it much. So, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. I'm not sure what to make of that. I, I, uh, I, maybe you can't catch lightning in a bottle more than once or, or in, I, I always thought that it would be like somebody like, you know, Stephen King or John Grisham once you broke through and, you know, had a fairly solid reader base, um, that it would hopefully not be too much trouble to get to the second book. But, uh, if for whatever reason, in my case, it's just not happening. Um, I've, I've, uh, I'm going, I'm, I haven't given up yet, but I'm kind of on a hiatus at the moment. Sure. Well, it, Stephen King's a he's an yeah. anomaly. <laughs> like, yeah, Stephen King is a know, machine. I, yeah, I don't understand. I don't. Yeah, Whew. some of these guys have a tap and they can just turn <laughs> it on. Uh, it, you know, you look at other authors out there, and there's people that you know. I'll read about somebody, and I'll be like, "Wow, they were a really successful author." And then it's like, "Wow, well, they published like one book every ten years, and they ended up publishing six total books." And you're like, "Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> okay." <laughs> so. Uh, there's there's a lot of you know gaps in there. Sanderson's one of my favorite authors, and that yep. guy puts out like three books a year. Yeah, it's crazy. It's just, it, it's I don't know how to they keep do up it. reading it. <laughs> I know, right? But they're, they're, huge, they're huge books. But uh, yeah, Stephen King's in the same boat. You know, he is yeah. one a year at minimum. It seems that's just outrageous to me. Uh, I don't know how he does it. I really, I, I saw a thing with him and George R. R. Martin were uh, kind of on stage somewhere. And, um, George, <laughs> you know, it, it, George was, you know, still kind of working on Winds of Winter, um, uh -huh. to this day, I think. And he's like, how do you do it? <laughs> to Stephen King. And he's like, oh, <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's not just me. So, um, I, I yeah, yeah. Stephen, Stephen King's an anomaly. He's that guy is, I, yeah. yeah, I didn't fully appreciate just how much of an anomaly until I actually got into the position where I had book number two. Yeah. When you're like, hey, wait a second, I've got to do this, and <laughs> this <Yeah>. is hard. <laughs> it, yeah, yeah. No, I get it. What does your uh, wife think about it? Does she is she a big reader as well? Uh, oh yeah, she is. Um, she, yeah, you, it's kind of an inside joke. Um, I, you know, at the end, uh, the very last part about Char Irwin is in um, um, prison, and he's reading Janet Ivanovich. I have uh -huh. not personally read much Janet Ivanovich. She did a how to write book that I read, uh, but my wife loves her and she's just cackling over there on the, you know, on the other side of the bed. Um, and apparently during, and, you know, this, the, she's got this whole series of, of uh, you know, one for the money and da 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 da, -da uh, And uh, they just get progressively more insane. No longer my wife reads. They've got like a, 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 a tele, like a talking monkey or something, or maybe a, I can't remember. He's a magic monkey or a talking monkey or something like that. And she's just cackling over there about it. So, um, <laughs> yes, she's a big reader as well. Not the same That's stuff, but in, in that was, it's great juxtaposition because you've got this, you know, a hardened military guy. And yeah, I think you had that in that prison scene where he's like, you know, the guards like, Oh really? And he's like, look, I can do whatever I want. And it's just, <laughs> You, you set it up so well because that is a thing that a lot of people you know i haven't read janet and that's part of it i'm like well i'm you know i'm a dude and you know I've, I've, yeah. i need swords manly. and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> manly stuff so we our tastes are kind of 
you know, I like that self-confidence that your character Erwin, you know, has. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, and I mean, there's a, there's a thing, you know, you're supposed to really kind of, one of the tips that I got at a writing workshop was that when you have, uh, you want your characters to have two completely opposite traits in, in a lot of cases. Um, so like, you know, David, uh, I don't, not to get too spoilery, uh, you know, being like this killing machine, but he's wearing a tutu, which is not like the most, you know, it, it looks ridiculous, but sure. it, yeah. Uh, so, you know, that kind of stuff, but he, and he was mean to everybody, but he loved that, that old woman in the, whose house they were staying at, you know, they all thought he was going to like kill her when she made him wash his hands. And he's like, no, no, thanks grandma. And you know, she gave a little kiss on the cheek or whatever. Um, so everybody's got a soft spot and even the, the mean ones have a nice spot and the nice ones have a mean spot kind of thing. Yeah. That's great advice. I've never thought about that. No one's at least told me that. So that might be something. I thought it was too. I really did. (laughs) It's directly where the tutu came from too. He was, I think I had him in like battle armor or something in a first draft. Well, Um, he was terrifying. He, you, you killed it with some of these people and there, there were parts in it where I'm like, man, I don't think I could, I wouldn't be able to think about that because that's not something I could have done. So I, I don't know if that's your, you know, you like horror movies and that's something I'm not usually into or like, how did you get to that point where you're like, I'm going to write these people that do some things that your everyday mortal is just not even going to process as an option. Yeah. Cause that seemed to come up a lot. <laughs> oh, good. Interesting question. I don't know. That was kind of the, uh, one of the things that I've noticed, I read a lot of, I uh, read and read a lot of, you know, kind of different mythologies over the years. And it always seemed like, uh, the gods, you know, for whatever culture you're talking about, were basically just people who have really amplified appetites. You know, if Hercules wasn't just cleaning out the stable, he was cleaning out the stables of, you know, whatever it was that he had to divert a river to do it and all, all these things. And so it wasn't, um, it was it wasn't uh, so much that they were doing anything qualitatively different. It was just that the 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 intensity was turned up. So when I was doing when I was editing the book, anytime they were doing something that was relatively normal, uh, I would try to take it and just like turn it up to ten or past ten. Like you may remember the people who've read the book will probably remember the bull scene. Um, or, yes, you know, <laughs> yeah. That that was, was original. <laughs> yeah, that that kind of took off. That that uh, what happened there was um, it was you know a don't share your catalog uh, was one of the plot points that I just needed to have in there so that they couldn't all. And the idea was that father didn't want them all to to gang up on him and and you know kind of team together and be, and because you know collectively they knew pretty much everything he did and they might have you know he did he didn't want to be overthrown um, so he made when it. I, as originally written, he gave, when they were all little kids, he gave them this very stern speech about how you're not supposed to share your catalogs. And it was just a speech. And I'm like, you know what? That's not very operatic. So what could I do that would really make an impression on people? And that's kind of where that came from. Um, it was like the it. Wor- it was the worst thing I could think of. I, um, I, I, just, I, I remember reading about it in like third grade or something. My, my, one of my a grade school teacher was really into mythology and she told us about it. And I'm like, I'm not sure that's what you ought to tell a third grader. Um, <laughs> Excuse me. This is the formative years. You know, yeah. Right. Like a fetish is coming out of this or some yeah. <laughs> going dark places. <laughs> uh, yep. It explained. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So, yeah. So yeah, that's where that came from. I got you. Well, and that, that makes sense. There was a, and I've, I've totally forgotten the books uh, series that I was reading, but that was how this other author dealt with his gods. Was he uh, basically, regular people became a god because they became the the utmost ideal of that thing so you know whoever loved the hardest and the most and was the most you know person feeling love became the god of love and you know whoever was then this is the big plot point whoever was best with a sword became the sword you know the god of swords and uh they basically just you know once was that, you... the, was that that sounds like the Piers anthony stuff was that was that possibly that, his Oh, he had a whole series see. about it, like, like late eighties, I think. Uh, no, not Pierce Anthony's. Uh, this is semi new. This, oh, what is his name? I'd have to go hunt it down. Uh, nah, it's, right. he sounds like French or Canadian. It's something that, that's why I have trouble remembering it. He has a okay. non-standard American name. All right. Uh, Tougher to stick with it. I get it. I'll throw it in the show notes whenever I find it. I really enjoyed it, but that was kind of the thing. And I'm sure it's not original because what is original, but yeah, uh, <laughs> you know, nothing. Yeah. Yep. Nothing under the sun. Yeah. So, so, okay. I say that, that you want to 
the things that really drew me to your uh, book was it seems very original. I know obviously you, you're pulling mythology stuff and you're pulling all these different experiences, but overall it was a very original book. Um, it was also a really Thanks. clever uh, book. <laughs> and you're welcome. Again, we'll try not to throw too many okay, compliments. Yeah. Uh, it's tough, I know. <laughs> yeah. What do you so, say? You know, you know, it's just like, oh, yeah. thanks. Uh, <laughs> please don't talk about it. <laughs> so, you, uh, you had some, and I, hopefully, you haven't read many of the reviews because I think that's bad for people. But uh, you have a bunch of really negative reviews about people not getting it. Do you think you might have written a book that was maybe too smart for <laughs> some of the masses? I don't know. People like what they like. I mean, it's, sure. I, I really, I, I, I am 100% uh, on the, this is like one of my, my core cornerstones of my belief system or whatever is that you're allowed to enjoy whatever you enjoy and vice versa. I, uh -huh. I, I, I will, that is a hill I am prepared to die on. Cause I mean, you get, uh, you know, like if you're, if you have, if you've ever been on the internet, you know, that as soon as somebody likes something that somebody else will come along and tell them why they shouldn't have liked it. That just drives me <laughs> yes. absolutely crazy. Um, so and the flip side of that is if you didn't like it, you didn't like it. You know, okay, if that's there's other side. Sorry, um, I'll try harder next time, <laughs> or you know, move on. You know, it's there. Once it's out in the world, there's really not much you can do about it. I'm glad. I'm glad a lot of people liked it, and I'm sorry the other ones didn't. And that's really about it. That it doesn't honestly didn't hurt my feelings that much. Well, and that's that brings up a point that I run into in my day to day life. There's I'm, I'm very easy to please in terms of like entertainment. And, yeah. Uh, I have other people in my life, lots of them actually, that it seems that their real desires, they want to be a critic and it drives me yeah. nuts. I'm not been able to figure <laughs> yeah. out why, but it, that's part of it. It's that your core belief you're talking about there. That's what it is. It's like, you know, if someone likes something, let them, let them like it. You don't need to convince people that they're wrong about liking something. Yeah. <laughs> it, I mean, it drives me nuts. Let's say you win the argument. What are they going to imagine? Oh, now I like it. You know, I mean, uh -huh. no, it doesn't work like that. Just, well, so, you know, well, what didn't you like about it? And then, you know, kind of you can calibrate the next time you go to the movies together. Maybe we shouldn't suggest X and instead should suggest Y kind of thing. But that's okay. as far as it goes. And I'm convinced that whenever you come into something looking to find problems for it, you can find them. There's, there's oh, nothing yeah. that you can't find problems with. And if you want to spend your time hunting for problems and, oh, I found problems, therefore it's bad. Like, it's just, that's so unfulfilling unless, I don't know, maybe that is how you get fulfilled. Maybe it's just a different version of the same argument. Hey, if that's what people like to do, let yeah, them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, it drives yeah. me nuts because I'm like, hey, quit trying to talk me out of this. Like, I enjoyed <laughs> this book. I enjoyed this movie. Like, you don't have to, you know, bash me in the ground about it. It's, I don't know, drives <laughs> me nuts, so. Yeah, like that's what is the Simpsons guy? Worst episode ever. People are like that. Yeah, Especially they really are. They're, they're... They are. But we'll just leave it at that, I guess. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. So, I've got another question about your uh, your technical background a little bit because that's always interesting. Sure. And you know, part of this, you know, Dead by Tomorrow, we're looking at, you know, how do you how do you bring your whole life into focus and how do you do your stuff day to day, you know, as if it's meaningful. So I figure you're working, you're making money, you know, your actual career, uh, mm -hmm. day to day at least. You know, it's not that writing isn't your career, but writing is a is a long term gambit in terms of money. You know, it's yeah, like you had however long, you know years to write your first book and then you know it takes years for that money to really trickle and pay it back if you're lucky so yep. was there anything while you're working this day job i will call it that bled into the book like any parts of it that you're like oh this piece of coding or oh gosh Linux or whatever um, came in or helped you know define what you're writing probably not i uh there so I, I kind of wrestled with that a little bit. Um, have you read much Neil Stevenson, like oh, Cryptonomicon? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So like at one point I was thinking about doing like a, a, you know, something kind of in that vein, like a Cryptonomicon uh, or, you know, all all I am or something like that, where it's you mm -hmm. know, kind of all, all mathy. Um, yeah. And I, I it, honestly, Stevenson, it's, it's his, he's got it. You know, it would, anything I came up with would be, derivative of him so i was trying to come up with something a little bit different just stay away from i mean there's I, I i read a lot of like biographies of mathematicians and that showed up a little bit in mount char here and there but um it's not like a core element of the plot really so generally no i was i was trying try to stay away from the technical stuff uh in in um in the book i gotcha that 
it's a fair point. It, Stevenson, he goes deep into that technical. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he does it really well. Um, he's he's a smart Yeah, guy. he is. Yeah. And, um, and, I mean, and the, the other, like, again, getting back to the other thing I was saying, like, at, at the end of the day, I really just don't want to think about it anymore. I mean, I've, I've had, you know, um, it's, it's, I get all that, I get all of it that I'm interested in at the, at the day job. I got you. That's, that's a hard line to kind of draw in the sand. I would think for a lot of people. So that's impressive uh, that you're like, nope, <laughs> this is where you're going to stay. And I'm, I'm not going to flex my technical prowess in this book I'm writing. A lot of people kind of want to blend those both worlds together. Yeah. I, I, I could see, I could see anything that I was, that's why I was asking. I was like, I didn't really notice it. You know, maybe some of the, the structure you're using could have been related to, you know, logical no, but I, I couldn't find it that's why i was asking <laughs> no it, it probably wasn't there um i, I just and my, honestly it's wouldn't even really like a, a hard decision for me i just uh like i said i i um when I, by the time i'm done with the technical day job i want I, that's the last thing i want to do more of I, that's a, totally understandable yeah so You've talked about uh, Stevenson and King and some of these guys. Do you, I mean, I know you said that <laughs> partly uh, reading fiction's kind of gotten off topic for you, or at least out of your daily schedule. Do you have a favorite author that you're like, man, if I could just read this guy or girl, this is who I'd read? Or, you know, was there someone beforehand that then shifted? Oh, gosh. Um, I mean, I've got probably half a dozen uh, that I would consider favorites. Um, so uh, Thomas Harris, who wrote, the Silence of the Lambs and all the Hannibal Lecter stuff is, I, I think, just absolutely brilliant. I, I love him. Um, he's not, I don't think he's, he's has, he only recently, he put one out a couple of years ago uh, that I don't think did quite as well as some of his others. And I think he's semi-retired now, but I absolutely admire his stuff and would encourage anybody who with, to, anybody who's interested in the thriller side of things to, to read him. He's got some, he, he's, he's really good with taking characters that are just monsters and making them, you know, ever so slightly sympathetic. Um, Red Dragon was just the, 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 the pinnacle of that for me. The guy was like, I, I don't know how familiar you are with the story, but the, the, the main, the main bad guy was a serial killer and obviously not very sympathetic. But when you read about his childhood, it was hard not to feel at least a twinge for the guy um, that, you know, monsters are, born they're made kind of thing um so Thomas <laughs> I, Harris is i see where that was in your writing too <laughs> yeah yeah exactly yeah that was that was directly out of thomas harris i, I yep. yep the copy paste kind of thing mm -hmm. um yep. i really enjoyed joe haldeman who's a science straight science fiction writer for the most part uh i think he's also retired uh stephen king um neil gaiman uh um and you know i've got i've got three thousand books i like them all for one reason or another but those are probably <laughs> yeah. the those are among the people who I'll pick up without reading the blurb. Yeah, you'd see that author and you're like, yes. And and that's probably a better way. Thank you for that. Next time I phrase that question as somebody, you know, who's the author you pick up without even reading about? It. They have a book out. Yeah. It's like, yep, yep, reading that. Neil, no, I get that's a good way he, to put it. Yeah. Do you see uh Neil Gaiman's releasing an album? Is he? No, I didn't yes. know that. He uh he just dropped a single and uh, let me preface this with i am not a music person like yeah me I either listen to audiobooks when i'm working out when i'm driving yeah me like, too yeah it's it's all the time so yep. and it's weird for uh we'll call them regular people uh because they're like oh what do you like listen yeah. to audiobooks and they're like well i meant like music i was like i don't know like there's some alternative rock in there if i really need to pump up or like you know there's some things from high school yeah. or middle school or whatever exactly like, <laughs> uh yeah, my, my, i don't know <laughs> <laughs> that's that's exactly you're the you're the only one i've ever met who's i'm the, I'm the exact same way i swear to god and you uh, get it dri yeah drives my wife nuts she's she's all you know american idol yes. and all that um, everyone it, people look at me like i'm a, a serial killer and i'm just like look it's just i don't know it's music I don't, yeah I, it doesn't do it. much we for me yeah i don't want to turn everybody else off because we're, we're <laughs> the only two people in this entire world uh, yeah. <laughs> it's goofy <laughs> yeah, that may but, be true yeah mm -hmm. But so saying that it's, I'm not usually plugged into the music scene, but because it was Neil Gaiman, it kicked up into my, you know, whatever algorithms run my life at this point and was like, Hey, Neil Gaiman's got this thing. And I was like, that, is that the same Neil Gaiman? I listened to it. And sure enough, he, uh, did... he composed an entire album hooked up with a string quartet that he really liked. And they dropped the single for Halloween basically. And it's just it kind of fun little halloween single with the string quartet and they're going to release the whole album later on in 2023 i think so no Check kidding it, out. it was kind of fun yeah i will I'll do, I'll do that i had no idea i saw a comment that they're like neil gaiman's just going to take over the entire uh 
artistic you know creativity yeah. space and I, <laughs> I was like that's true he just he doesn't stop he's got tired of you know comic books and now he's doing it's just everything he touches everything he's phenomenal. yeah he's yeah he really is he's he's just an amazing talent it, does that make it hard for you i know for me i i struggle and i'm obviously nowhere near the success of your book but like seeing people like Guyman or King or Sanderson or any of these guys it where you talked about like, you know, I don't want to be derivative of Stevenson. It makes it hard. Cause you're like, I love this book, but I don't think I can, I can do what they're doing. How do you walk that line between people you love reading or even oh, watching? Yeah. It's, it. it's tough. Yeah, it is. It's tough. Um, hmm. I guess uh, in the writing process, if I, you just kind of, you, you got to do it with a clear, it, it, to me, Mike, I just don't feel good about it. If it's something that's blatantly consciously, if, if I, if I notice that, oh yeah, you, you know, Neil Gaiman did X in, in terms of plot points or something in one of his books, or Stephen King did X and in, 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 as a plot point in some of his books, I'll try to stay away from that. But I think it's fair play to kind of analyze their body of work and look at the techniques they use. Um, so as a, for instance, um, a game, it seems to, uh, I, a lot of the Sandman series really seem to me to be like daytime drama, um, that was writ with, you know, he took, he turned the characters up to 11. It, it, he had this kind of dysfunctional family and they were all playing politics against each other, but they also happened to be, you know, gods essentially. Mm -hmm. And, um, I, I think, I think uh, Shakespeare did this a lot, a very similar thing. You know, it was like, a lot of this stuff, a lot of Shakespeare, I think, was the enjoyment for the audience was enhanced because it was all these like, you know, kings and and occasional supernatural, you know, cameos and and that kind of thing. So um, t without, you know, doing something with the endless probably would have not been cool, but I felt like it was fair play to come up with some, you know, to use that uh, kind of to have a family drama that with that had, uh, you know, larger than life characters. Or characters you. with larger than life skill sets. So that was fair play. So in that sense, that that's kind of where I draw the line. Plot points, no. Techniques, yes. I see. So, and that's also what you're talking about, where it becomes uh, problematic to read other fiction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's part of it. You're dissecting, you know, hey, you know, I'll steal that technique or bar steal. Yeah, we'll go with steal. I, I was Steel's fair. That. Yep. Uh, yeah, there's that. Uh, yeah. There's another <laughs> right. book, the steel book. What was it called? Do you know what I'm talking about? Steal, uh, steal this book by Abby Hoffman. Maybe it's, mm -hmm. it's been a while, but basically that's what they're talking about. Like, Hey, there's nothing wrong. As long as you steal it, make it your own, use it your own way, you know, take the technique, yeah. but give it your own spin. It's fair. Good. Fair play. Good artist said. borrow. <laughs> good artist borrow. Great artist steal. Yes. I think that's yeah. what I was thinking about. Yeah. So, I get it. Yeah. I'm, I'm all, I'm completely on board with that. So, Again, we, we kind of try and we're trying to teach people, help people show people like, Hey, here's the kind of the directions you can take your life. Uh, here's the way you go about it. So you've got two, what I would call enviable careers. You're a successful novelist. And, uh, like I said, most of the guys I know in tech, they get pretty excited if they can get up to that sys admin job, because that's kind of a. You know, the, the, an end all, it almost seems to be like before you become a CIO for a company on doing tech work. Had, what, did you, what did you do to get there? You know, first on the book, was there like a, you sat down every day and wrote for three hours at from five to seven or 7 p.m. to 9 p.m.? And then, you know, what was the career jump to go from a coder to a sysadmin or was it just kind of fell in your lap? Well, it was kind of a, it, I mean, it was kind of a, um, well, I've bounced back and forth between a lot. I've, wore, I've had a lot of hats. I've worn a lot of hats in the technical field. I did. I started out as like a DBA, and then um, I wrote the I wrote a Linux book back in like two thousand or ninety nine or something like that. That really got me like comfortable with like the the deep workings of like Linux, and that's been a really nice kind of fallback all through my career. Just it's good stuff to know if I'm if you're working in a Linux environment, having that like kind of solid base of just what every command does and kind of thing um, is is handy. Um, uh, coding, I, I just, I, I think it's more of a young man's game. Um, I'm probably, I just don't have the, the energy and drive for it that I kind of used to. I mean, some of these guys, uh, the guys that I work with, um, are, are just absolutely super sharp, uh, Java guys. And, uh, I, I'm, 
my, my role is more like support and debug. So I, honestly, I would say it's not like the pinnacle of the tech field. It's, it's, this is more of a, you know, like a linebacker as opposed to the quarterback kind of thing. Well, I am happy to stand corrected. Like I said, I, I don't go into that world. My, my world's internet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, I mean, but everybody, you know, everybody, everybody, but everybody contributes in their own way, et cetera, et cetera. But, um, I'm, it's a good, it is a good job. I mean, there's nothing wrong with it. It's just like, uh, you, if you want to rock the, the guys who are really driving the, the train or, or the coders. Mm-hmm. I gotcha. So what did you start out with? Was it Linux? Uh, woo, my first job was on, um, uh, no, it was, it was like AT&T Unix, I think, but this, this was like 93, I think. So I don't even remember anymore. It was, I, there was a database called Informix, um, and I was doing programming with uh, something called Informix for 4GL that you probably never even heard of. It died out, mm-hmm. I don't know, 15 years ago. And then just, you know, one thing I hopped to another, I did a lot of, uh, systems programming in C for a while. Uh, I did some web development, uh, ran some web servers, um, uh, then did kind of like tool smithing for, uh, long pipelines. Um, and ended up what I'm working on now is something is a product called Hadoop, which is a big data kind of ecosystem that, uh, lets you hold like petabyte scale databases and move stuff through them and that kind of thing. But that's probably not the core of the interview. <laughs> so I'll just, I'll let it go with that. <laughs> no, it's so funnily enough, we, uh, Daniel and I, the other, guy that hangs out on this podcast with me usually uh we did a little monthly challenge for sequel just back in february so oh yeah i got a i got a pretty okay tutorial on sequel and actually really enjoyed it um so yeah I, i'm leaning it's more towards use- databases nowadays oh yeah i love them yeah useful uh, skill <laughs> we were working on and this is just a little sidebar on it uh, and it was one of those things i was like i didn't know the solution you know six months ago but we're working on this application for getting some government grant money and they dropped us this csv with it was like nine hundred thousand rows which is why you have a database because excel or google sheets or any of these guys they can't handle that kind of data (laughs) and so i was trying to manipulate this data with you know almost a million rows and it just you know wouldn't i've got this you know into macbook air and it didn't matter what my computer was doing. Excel itself was just like, no, sorry, we're good. So I did this little V lookup and it was just done. My computer was like, no, yep, yep, we can't do that. And I was like, why would you drop this to me and not give me a database to work with instead? And, you know, it's really cool to know that kind of stuff or at least know about it. It is. Yeah, it's handy. So it's cool. Um, let me jump you over to the author thing then. Okay. What was your process like writing the book? And has it changed since you... Uh, let's say gain success. <laughs> um, hmm. Uh, it did change. Uh, okay. So when I, I, this was, uh, Mount Char was actually the fourth novel, fourth manuscript that I completed the other three for uh, the third one I thought was shaky. I think arguably there, the case could have been made that the third one was publishable, but the first two were just basically practice. They weren't, they weren't ready for prime time. Sure. Um, the, uh, so, when I was writing Mount Char, um, I would kind of do it. Uh, I did it a, initially. I did it a little sporadically. I would just have, I would have like an idea for a scene. Um, uh, there were like three core scenes in the book. Like the one in, like with like the neighborhood picnic at the end uh, was originally going to be the uh, one of the intros intro scenes. Um, I'm going to be a little vague here to avoid spoilers. Sure. Uh, the one where um, Steve and Carol and meet at the bar and they decide to go break into a house was another one. And I just thought it was kind of an interesting scenario. Um, and uh, God, what's the other one anyway? So I had, so I had those and maybe three other scenes um, that I just kind of worked on just cause they were interesting. The, oh, the third one was uh, Steve jogging through the neighborhood and, and um, he runs into some dogs. Uh, that mm-hmm. actually happened to me, by the way, that was, that was no a way. <laughs> no, it did. Yeah. I was, I was looking at it. Yeah, it was, it was actually really scary. Um, I mean, they didn't obviously didn't maul me, but it was like this kind of a, like it was this neighborhood where uh, the houses weren't, the, the neighborhood wasn't fully developed and the street ran down maybe a half mile past where I was living at the time. And in the woods, it was where people would go to drop off all their strays. So there was this pack of stray dogs living oh. in there and they weren't happy. To, they were not happy to see me. And I was like, man, they were, they chased me for about half a block before. And I'm like, ah, get me out of here. <laughs> scariest, scariest thing of my life. Everybody thinks they're tough until you actually run up to an animal that's ready to have some beef with you and you go, Oh, you yeah. know what? These, these human hands and human teeth are not prepared for just yeah. about anything. <laughs> this chihuahua is going to take me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. 
That's wild. Yeah. So I wrote those down and I was just kind of trying to think about ways to like rearrange them and string them out uh, or rearrange them and maybe string them together. What, you know, what, what could the storyline be here that would connect these three things? And that, and I, so I I would like write one and then think about it for a couple of weeks, then write another one and think about it for a couple of weeks. And I was a lot slower and more, um, I, I, I mean, I was at that point, I'd been failing to get anything published for like 25 years. I was mostly just doing it as a hobby. I kind of enjoy it. Uh, Mm -hmm. and and eventually I was like, oh, hey, I know how to, I know how to put all this together. And so then I sat down and got into a very focused about six months, um, where that was really all I did. Uh, and you know, that, that ended up working out. Um, after the book, after it got published, I did try to, I I did go through a period of about five years where I was writing every day and I put together two completed manuscripts and one half manuscript that nobody liked. Um, so they, that's, I mean, it wasn't that, that I wasn't good. working. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, but, but at least I got one. Yeah. Um, at least I got one out there and I haven't given up, but I, I've, I've kind of, I've been on hiatus for the last couple of months. Sure. So how did you find, did you go find an agent? Did you find the publisher directly? You know, how did you actually yes. get to the big leagues, I guess? Yeah. Um, so the, like I said, the third book almost made it. Um, she, she, there's a, there's a process called what you do is you send in a query letter, which is like a one page letter, you know, um, describing your book and would you like, you know, would you like to see, or usually like the first five pages of the manuscript or something. Um, and the agent will, the agent's assistant more typically will at least look at it and see if it passes first cut. They will pass it on to the agent who may or may not request the full manuscript. And the next stage from that would be, they will either offer representation or not. Um, in this case, uh, of my third book, um, the agent I sent it to is my now agent, uh, at, uh, Liza Dawson, a lady named Caitlin Blaisdell. Um, she read the third book, liked it well enough to, to like read the entire manuscript and said it, what she didn't think it was going to sell. Um, but get back to her with, uh, whatever I came up with next. So that was, I don't know, probably five years before Mount Char came out uh, or before I wrote Mount Char. Um, so five years later, five was like, well, I've, you know, just getting, just having an agent willing to put eyes on your manuscript is a big step. That's, that's yeah. I mean, it's, it's a hugely competitive process. So I, I, you know, workshopped it to death and polished it as best I could and then queried the agent and everything really went pretty quick from there. She read it pretty much overnight, offered representation within a week or so and had, had we, we did like a, a couple, we did maybe two months worth of rewrites. Um, and then it sold like first week out. Wow. Big, I bet big that was day. a bit of a whirlwind. <laughs> <laughs> best yeah man I, oh i was on top i was on top of the world i mean i was really some of the best days of my life so you don't really me, you don't really appre- appreciate succeeding at something until you failed at it for like three decades i mean yeah, ronald and reagan then someone ronald, gives you that <laughs> yeah ronald reagan was president when i first started sending in manuscripts um so this and this was you know like I said it came out in 2015 or whatever i, I bet that was a nice dopamine hit <laughs> yeah, oh my yes yeah big times at the hawkins house so, so what did you do to celebrate? I assume they gave you an advance or something of some sizable amount. Did you go buy something cool or did you go on vacation or did you just have a little party and call it quits? And um, what, what was your celebration? Yeah. Well, we, I mean, we went out to dinner that night, you know, they, they don't like the, the advances come. I think you get, uh, typically you get like a, like 25% of the advance on, uh, I forget how it works. It was 25% on signing and 25% on editorial completion, another 25% on publication or something like that. And, and I'm missing a 25% somewhere, obviously. Mm-hmm. So it wasn't like I immediately had this big check. Um, but, uh, the, you know, I knew the money was coming trickling in and, um, I, I used it, to, I, I, I used it to move house. Honestly, I, I, I put a down payment on it, on a, on a, on a place a few miles down the road from where I'd been living, um, which is where I'm at now. Oh, I gotcha. Well, that sounds like a worthwhile use of your <laughs> money. Then it sounds like yeah. it led in good directions. Yes. Yes, it did. And this, yeah. So y'all weren't together whenever you first published. Uh, oh, um, y'all who? Uh, you and your wife? Well, no, sorry. Yeah. Um, we were, we had just gotten married when, uh, Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I think when the book came out, we had just gotten married, but I, as I was writing it, we were, we were just kind of, we'd been together for like five years at that point. So, I mean, and we, neither of us has any kids. So well, we both have previously married. Neither of us has a kid as kids. So, I mean, it wasn't the difference between married and, and the transition between married and not, or not married and married wasn't 
a particularly dramatic one. It was really just we went out to Vegas and Elvis married us. Um, so it, did, it didn't <laughs> Wait, change. Did that really all happen? <laughs> yeah, no, that really That's did. Awesome. <laughs> oh yeah, got married by Elvis. Oh. He did a good job too. I definitely recommend the Elvis. And I mean, you you, you know, wedding planning is what I don't think anybody's idea of a good time. And she just she just no. wanted the yeah. Uh, that's one of the white dress. So that was all we did. I, I go to Vegas probably a little too much. And oh, do you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. And that's it's always one of those things. I'm like, I can see it. And they have some nice places. You know, all the the hotels they've got some really much better, at least in Amarillo, Texas, uh, chapels or you know places to get married. And uh, I can see the appeal. Uh, take yeah. all the headache yep. out. You know, if you want to invite people, Vegas is there. Everybody likes to go to Vegas. You know, yep. I like it. Buddy, That's cool. buddy, good buddy, good friend of ours uh, did the same thing. He we, it was years before I met him. Uh, he and his wife, uh, they, there's like a drive through wedding chapel in Vegas. And that's what they did. No right? way. <laughs> yeah. A, a literal drive through. Uh, so they were passing, they were going from Cal, <laughs> passing through on their way from California to Georgia. And like, you want to get married? Sure. Let's pull in here. You know, that's just yeah. wild. I haven't yeah. seen that. I'll next, I'll be back for CES in January. I'll go yeah, look for right. it. Yeah. <laughs> See if, see if I can find the drive through. Yeah. That's Elvis cool. Elvis is cool though. I definitely I definitely recommend Elvis. I didn't I didn't have to see the drive through. See, I'm I, I'm not married, and my girlfriend. If that became the uh, the situation, I think I would be in a world of pain if I tried to suggest something like that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean it's so, it's all about what the bride wants. It really is. Yeah, and, and, I'd be in a I'd be in, I think that'd be a blast, honestly. But I, yeah, I would be overruled very quickly. I'm fairly yeah. certain. So, yeah. Uh, it. it Sorry, I had another question with your, uh, the earnings, just because this is always something interesting to me, because writing is fun for a lot of people, but making it a career is a whole different ballgame. It's not even the same game. Um, I understand you have to earn out that advance that you were talking about, the 25%. Yes. Uh, What was your time frame on that? I assume you've earned it out because, again, your books seem to have done really well. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think it was about three years before it earned out three years were you worried at all um well you don't have to give the advance back so i mean I think right. anything was <laughs> anything was gravy um uh, and i mean uh-huh. they you there are ways to make a profitable i have been told i don't really know what i don't really know what this means specifically but i've been told that even if a book doesn't earn out its advance it can still be pretty profitable uh for the house so but earning out your advance is obviously better than not earning it out. And mm-hmm. I, I did, and it's been, it's been several years. So it's, I mean, it's still, it's, it seems to be selling pretty steadily. I um, you still get your royalties uh, monthly, yearly or something now, right? Yes. Yeah, biannually. Biannually twice a year. Yep. Interesting. Uh, yep. <laughs> well, that's cool. Congratulations again. Yeah. Um, thank you. I've always just wondered about that. Cause I know there's a lot of people, especially on their, you know, first published book. And this is completely from a theoretical reading about other people's experiences, uh, viewpoint, but I understand a lot of people don't usually earn out their first book and it's okay because it's like, well, we try and we'll, you know, release a couple more books and we expect down the road, we'll start earning out commissions or uh, royalties. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, they, I think that's the kind of the general policy, but again, they don't, you know, everybody's deal is a little different. So I, 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 I don't think there's a one size fits all answer, but yeah, I think that's, I think that's fair. I got you. Are you still in contact like on a regular basis with your agent or? Yes. She, uh... Uh, well, I haven't had much, I haven't had a whole lot to send her lately. So I don't want to like call, you know, I've, one <laughs> thing I've noticed, one thing I've noticed about publication or about, um, the, the publishing industry is the emails tend to be really short and to the point. So it's not like we sit around and like, you know, gossip or whatever um so I, you know i check in with her once or twice a year and uh, you know have you got anything well not yet and you know that that's kind of that right. so well um, luckily they work with multiple people and it's her day yeah. job so yeah <laughs> you know, she probably doesn't want to take her work home she's Too probably much. she's probably ready to strangle me at this point i do need to get something out to her <laughs> well i won't tell her we'll, we'll just not mention that you came on here and you were really busy writing and yeah Andrew who <laughs> yeah that's cool. Yep. Sounds like a good person. I mean, anybody who is, you know, and obviously it's her job, but anybody who helps move that book forward, especially a good book. Um, oh yeah. She's they're, phenomenal. They're a win yeah. in my heart. Yeah. So, that's cool. She's phenomenal. She, oh, she's, I was just gonna say she's helped a lot of writers. Um, you know, Charlie Strauss, Charles Strauss, Charles Strauss, not off the top of my head. Uh, he's, he was one of my favorites. Um, also a programmer slash uh, writer. He, he was, I read, um, there's a good story. Okay. I, I had read a lot of his stuff, uh, he was one of the reasons actually that I, uh, applied to, um, this particular agent was because I knew she represented him. 
And he's just this phenomenal guy. I remember the the way uh, the, the way I, I first got introduced to his work was in one of those um, years best uh, science fiction and fantasy collections. And he had this one short story that really called it Calder War that really just knocked my socks off. And then like two days later, this was I, I was looking for some kind of really obscure technical issue um, uh, for with with a scripting language called Perl. And damn, it wasn't he wasn't damn if he didn't have the answer. This was back when Usenet was still. <laughs> so I, I go into this Perl forum and it was like the same guy. It was had the same email address and everything. And I was like, How, who is this guy? <laughs> uh, he's haunting you. <laughs> yeah. And he's just better at everything that I want to do than I am. It was... <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. Yeah, we've, we've swapped emails a couple of times since then. He's, he's a really cool guy. Wow. No, I haven't heard him, but I'll go, I'll look his stuff up. Yeah, definitely. Know? Yeah. Uh, the Laundry Files, I think, is what he's best known for. But he's, his short fiction is phenomenal, too. Okay, I'll check it out. I, there's very few things I won't read. I'm pretty pretty open. I enjoy most of it. Um, also, completely unrelated, but something just based on our conversation here you might like. I just watched the first episode of The Peripheral. Uh, yes. Yesterday. It's oh, phenomenal. So cool. Yes. It is really okay. fantastic. Yeah. They killed um, it. I ha- um, yep. I haven't yep. even read the book, which really upsets me because I'm a Gibson fan. But yeah, me too. Yo, are you good? Yeah. Love Gibson. Mm-hmm. Um, yep, it's good to see him finally getting some justice. The, the movie adaptations that have been made of his stuff were a little shaky. Well, if this thing doesn't just kill it, like, I mean, the quality is there. It. I, we watched the first episode seriously just last night, and it was just. I was like, "Wow, this is going to be great!" I'm excited. So, episode two was equally it. good. I with a, equal, episode two was equally good. Um, I haven't watched the third one that dropped on Friday, but it's probably what I'm going to do this afternoon. Good, good. Keep me posted on it. Let me know what you think because I I'm going to hit probably the second one. Probably won't be today, but sometime yeah. this week, hopefully, I'll make some time for it. Uh, they're long. Yeah, yeah. I was not ready for how long the episodes were either. Yeah, me either. Uh, but I'm, see- I'm, I'd rather that than not. <laughs> Well, the same guy did uh, Westworld. The, for, like the first season of Westworld, honestly, is one of the best things oh, I've ever seen on television. That, that makes sense. I hadn't put that together, but I could see the quality. They're yeah, yeah, they're on course. And the intro, the intro should have given it away. Uh, just watching the intro, it's like, man, this reminds me of something else I've watched. And now that you yeah. said Westworld, it just snapped. I was like, oh yeah, that that's what it was. <laughs> I think it's Jonathan Nolan and maybe a couple of the other partners from uh, from the first season of Westworld. Cool. Well, yeah, for everybody listening, uh, the peripheral is going to be the next hot thing, I hope. It was great. It is. So. It is. It's absolutely phenomenal. Mm-hmm. Well, Scott, I think I've I've eaten up your hour. Is there anything else you want to toss out there? Anything that I haven't asked you that you're like, people need to know this about you or your book or, you know, what you're doing next or anything like that? Um, or, you know, a cool quote you got. Whatever you want to, you know, finish this out with. <laughs> I don't know. I, I don't honestly, I don't have much. My only, my only, my only thoughts would be like, if you wake up in the middle of the night with a really strong stomach pain, go to the ER. Don't wait. The, the, the appendicitis thing. Don't, don't torture yourself. Yeah. Just it's get taken care better. of. Yeah. God, that scares me. I am. I think, you know, partly because I'm running around without insurance is probably why it scares me. Oh <laughs> yeah. Oh boy. That would be scary. And, yeah. Well, and it's one of those things. Most everything else is like, eh, you can kind of blame yourself if something happens to you or not. But, uh, appendicitis is just yeah that's roll of the exactly. dice it can just get you <laughs> yeah it's it it like what did i do to deserve this i mean <laughs> you know oh i get it yeah well sincerely thank you for making time i know you've got a lot of stuff going on in your world uh and you know it's been like a losing pleasure, an Andrew. organ <laughs> yeah <laughs> i didn't lose it we know just where it is but yeah. oh, okay well hopefully you didn't keep it by the way uh, no, because... no. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again. Uh, I really have enjoyed this. It's always fun to meet somebody else who uh, likes books more than music. So yeah, that's worth it by yeah. itself. We should start a club. Yeah. <laughs> all, all two of us. We might find a third in, you know, Japan yeah. or China or something. Yeah, right. Big world. Yeah. Triumphant. <laughs> well, thank you again. Uh, I'll have everything linked in the show notes to Scott's website and his book. And uh, if you really want to get technical, he's got some programming books on Linux that you can go look at. That's not my cup of tea, but uh, we'll have everything out there. So to everybody listening, thank you for coming on. Thanks for supporting Scott. And we look forward to connecting with you soon. Likewise. Thank you very much. It's been a real pleasure.